Okay, the recording has started. Uh, so let me introduce today's uh, spe the speaker of today, uh, Dr. Uh, Hamid Reza Sadrizami. Uh, one sec. Yeah, Mr. Sadrizami. Uh, he received his uh, bachelor's degree from uh, Kaji Nasi Tusi University, generally known to us as K and Tusi University in Tehran, Iran, and a master's degree from Shahid Beheshti University, again from Tehran, Iran, and PhD from Concordia University in Montreal, uh, all in the areas of electrical engineering. Uh, he was nominated for 2017's uh, Distinguished Dissertation Award at Concordia and also for the Quebec's uh, ADESAQ Award. He was a postdoctoral fellow with the Signal and Information Processing Lab at the Electrical and Computer Engineering Department Concordia from uh, six, June 2016 to 17. And then he was also a part-time faculty at the university, same university in 2017. Later, he joined uh, as a postdoctoral fellow under me and Professor Miodrag Bolich uh, from University of Ottawa. And he was a postdoctoral fellow with Biomedical Signal Processing Lab at the School of Electrical and Computer uh, Science. And since 2019, he has been a post he was a postdoctoral fellow with biosignals and systems analysis lab at bioengineering department, McGill University. And now currently he is uh, in the industry. Uh, his research interests include bio -sig biomedical signal processing, image processing, machine learning, data analytics, and statistical modeling. He has more than 50 journal articles uh, and conference paper and uh, he he was the chair of the IEEE Montreal Industrial Relationship uh, Committee since August of 2018 to December 2020. And he has been involved in organizing several successful research boost events, which is kind of unique with, uh, with the IEEE Montreal section. And um, based on all his contributions, he was recognized as an outstanding volunteer in 2019. And subsequently, he has become uh, currently the chair of the IEEE Montreal section. So congratulations, uh, uh, Hamid Reza, on becoming the chair of uh, IEEE Montreal section. The floor is yours. And then you can start and then give you Thank you time. very much, Thank uh, you. Dr. Rajan, for this long uh, introduction. And uh, thanks for everybody who is uh, present here. and. Also for all the other organizers of this event, it's a pleasure for me to be part of uh, this IEEE event. And uh, I know that this event is sponsored by EMBS uh, Society in Ottawa. So uh, that's why like the, the topic uh, is related to uh, healthcare mostly. So um, I'll uh, start uh, my uh, presentation by giving you um, an introduction of what is uh, pervasive healthcare, and then we go to um, uh, remote sensing part of uh, the, the pervasive healthcare, and we'll see some applications. And then I'll, I'll go to the details of uh, my recent uh, work, my recent paper, which is published very recently. And uh, then if you have any questions by the end of the presentation, just um, let me know. So uh, about the pervasive healthcare, uh, the, uh, we know that in like past few years uh, has witnessed the surge of interest in uh, daily activity monitoring and the human centered sensing attempts to have a comprehensive uh, uh, assessment of uh, people's living habits and health conditions. Several applications could benefit from uh, this uh, advanced human sensing including elder care in smart hospitals and uh, even at homes. So, but these systems are, um, are not uh, comprehensive and uh, there is still a long way to bring um, an effective and affordable human sensing system to the general public. And um, part of my research has focused on the, this, uh, the great potential and the social benefits of human-centered sensing, and more specifically on the use of contact sensing and remote sensing in healthcare. So um, mostly like for the remote sensing, which is 
the, the main part of these presentations, we're focusing on elder cares and for elderly living alone or in nursing houses for incident uh, prevention, detection, and uh, management. So a major challenge for healthcare is how to provide uh, improved uh, services to an increasing number of people using our limited financial and uh, human resources. So perverse, pervasive healthcare um, is considered a solution to many of the existing problems and a possible future of our current healthcare system. So in simple terms, pervasive healthcare can be defined as healthcare to anyone and at any time and anywhere. So this is realized by removing the locational and also time constraints while we, we can increase both the coverage and also the quality of the service. So the main goal of uh, pervasive healthcare is to support continuous well-being of uh, people rather than dedicating the existing resources only for treatment. So um, from, this, from the sensing modality point of view, we can categorize these uh, systems into contact sensing, including uh, many uh, known devices like wearable devices, like headbands, uh, like smart watches, smart clothing, and also uh, the smart belts. So using these body sensors or even in, uh, uh, interfaces, one can monitor physiological signals and processes in human body. So these systems uh, can, can be used as a distributed network working through uh, the existing wireless uh, technology. And we can realize a communication between um, these medical devices, between the patients and also the healthcare providers. The second category uh, is related to the remote sensors, which have been widely used for patient monitoring and for, for location tracking, localization, and so on. So among these sensors, we have radar, which uses uh, radio signals, and we have uh, LIDAR, which uh, uses infrared lights uh, from the lasers, and also we have cameras. So I will focus uh, this um, like on different attributes of uh, radar-based monitoring and uh, for the radar itself because uh, we know that uh, many of us know that uh, radar has several uh, attractive attributes like um, it's like it's non intrusive it has non, non it provides non intrusive sensing it's in insensitive in to lighting conditions uh, we don't have any privacy issue with the radar and also it's safe so all these features and attributes has brought the, the radar to the forefront of uh, indoor monitoring, which if you compare it and in, com in competition with like different sensors, like with cameras or with variable devices. So uh, unlike uh, variable devices, um, using radar, there is no need to wear a tag or any device. Also with radar, one can monitor multiple subjects uh, by one device, only one device. Also, it does not interfere with the daily activities. So you can do whatever you want. You can go to the bathroom, you can take a shower, but still your signals are being monitored. And also it's uh, well suited for the cognitively impaired users. Means if you cannot, or you simply forget to wear your tags and uh, there, there is no need actually to wear this tag. And uh, if you compare it with cameras, there is no privacy invasion using radar because many people, they do, they do not like to be captured uh, like 24 seven by cameras. Also the performance of the sensor like radar sensor is not affected by the environment, like by the lighting condition. Like if you, if you turn off the lights in uh, the room with camera, you cannot capture any signal, but still with the um, radar, you can capture the signal and the activities of the person there. Also, occlusion is not an issue with certain types of uh, radar. So these are all the attributes and features that uh, like has uh, given more priority to radar sensors in comparison to the variables and to the, to the cameras. 
So several applications, and I'll start with uh, some of the applications and then we focus on one. So several applications of the radar um, uh, sensing. Um, one is to monitor the biosignals like uh, the heartbeats and breath breathing rates of uh, the uh, patients or subjects. And it has like other applications of this uh, breathing rate estimation and uh, al also heart rate uh, estimation is in, in case of uh, like for the suicide event detection in the case that um, uh, the breathing is being stopped and these events can be simply detected by using the radar sensors. The other application is the localization and uh, detection of different activities, which is part of this uh, presentation, part of this research work. So many activities are being analyzed and uh, classified. Then uh, the other application is the detection of uh, drone or any other UAVs in a range Doppler uh, map by finding the uh, um, peaks in the uh, range Doppler domain. So it has um, several, uh, like um, has attracted many interest in especially the de defense organizations like the DRDC or RCMP, especially to detect uh, unknown objects at the borders. Um, also like uh, some uh, types of radars like ultra wideband radars, they are uh, being used for detection of uh, humans uh, moving uh, uh, subjects and also for uh, through the wall imaging and for search and rescue by like um, police and firefighters, they're using this kind of uh, sensors to find people under the rubble, especially in the case of earthquake. And these are all because of the at, uh, different attributes of the radar that as I mentioned, especially the ultra wideband kind of uh, radar, which has high uh, range resolution and very high uh, penetrability. And uh, one very important application, which we'll focus on it is uh, fall detection. So I'll give you some uh, statistics and ideas of the importance of uh, this uh, part of uh, my research. So one out of uh, three elderly falls every year and many injuries uh, uh, occur in the bathrooms are caused by falls. So most of the seniors require hospital admission following a bathroom fall. But we know that most of the seniors, they, they exercise self-care at their own homes, or if they are at very high risk of fall, they go to the you know, nursing institutions and care institutions, which is very costly. Even in the nursing houses, nursing institutions, there were plenty of uh, fall incidents. In some instances, these institutions um, have been sued for negligence because of the bathroom fall. Uh, when that's uh, like the senior or the patient was in their care. And um, like, this is very important because most of the seniors cannot uh, like get up by themselves after a fall, even if they don't see any like uh, direct injury because of the fall, but most of the seniors or like uh, the statistics that are given by who or uh, uh, the World Health Organization, um, like half of the seniors that they have fallen and because of this uh, and experience of it, like a extended period of lying down, they died within the six months after the incidents. Means it, it doesn't show you the direct injury, but like the internal effects and internal um, injuries are much higher. So like, what is, what is the gist here? The gist is prompt fall detection can save lives and reduces medical expenses. So it's very important. I'll continue with some uh, statistics uh, from uh, Statistics Canada. I took this picture from Statistics Canada and it shows that the elderly population aged over uh, 65 is growing and the ratio of the population will reach to 25% of the whole population by 2035. But we know that our uh, healthcare resources are very limited. Then when we look at these numbers, we, we, we notice that we need 
some intelligent healthcare automation. We need to have uh, this uh, like automatic approaches for our, our healthcare. So this is uh, again on the importance of having the uh, automatic approaches and systems for, for the healthcare and especially for the fall detection. So in, if you go into the details of what is fall and what is fall detection, in simple terms, fall is uh, an uncontrolled, unintentional, and a sudden change of posture from standing up, from standing to, um, to lying down positions. And also, uh, with the, of course, in lying down with the uh, period of time of lying down on the floor. So the fall uh, can result in injuries and it results in uh, reduced quality of life, especially for seniors. And it represents one of the leading causes of accidental death among the elderly population. So in this direction, and because of the importance of this uh, subject, we have started uh, this uh, project and we have developed several advanced uh, algorithms using uh, signal processing, image processing, and machine learning. So what you see here in this slide are different steps of uh, this a system and a project that we started with the data collection. We, we had some, uh, some volunteer subjects, we trained them and we had like uh, our uh, ethics uh, got approved. So when our data was ready, then we, we started uh, processing them. We had data wrangling, some like removing noise, uh, clutter removal and then uh, the pre-processing target selection in the, uh, like, because the kind of uh, signal that we get from the radar is a uh, scattering matrix. So we have to, we had to do some processing on that. Then like time frequency analysis, time, uh, time series analysis, different approaches. Then we had image processing uh, to, to binarize uh, the time frequency images uh, through different uh, methods, like through thresholding, through background removal, and also uh, morphological uh, operations, um, just to, to, to remove the disconnected regions and prepare a clean and clear shape of different activities to be used for, for our uh, uh, training and for our model. So also I shouldn't forget about the data augmentation. So we augmented our data to have like as much as the data samples for the training. And then we had feature extraction, model training and classifications are the different uh, steps of uh, our uh, project. Uh, so uh, talking about the, the, the logistics uh, that we have used, uh, we, we used an ultra wideband uh, radar, uh, which is working in um, the range of 5.9 to 10.3 uh, gigahertz. So we, we used the um, no, uh, Novelda Zetro X4 and transceiver. And um, the reason was that it has very high spatial resolutions and the sampling rate was uh, 200 Hertz, which is high enough to capture like uh, the high frequencies of the, any uh, fall incidence, which is around uh, 60, 70 Hertz. Then, um, as I uh, mentioned about the, the scattering matrix that we, we captured by our data collection, we had, um, yeah, the scattering matrix that we get from the radar includes the rows, which are the actual time samples and the columns, which are the, the, the range bins, means different distances of the subjects to the radar. So we call it uh, slow time versus fast time, which are the colors. Then we segmented our data to different uh, segments for different activities, like 15 second segments. And um, yeah, that's uh, pretty much all the information. And you can also see here the, the different activities uh, uh, that uh, we, we use for our uh, data collection and the numbers and also the numbers after the uh, augmentation. So uh, now it's, uh, it's time for like looking at different approaches and methods that we have uh, used and we have developed. So here we see that we have started with the time series directly, the time series that we received from the, time, uh, from the uh, scattering matrix, radar scattering matrix. We have 
process them and prepare the time series. So many approaches we, we have tested and developed like um, one dimensional convolutional neural network, like LSTM RNN, like um, dynamic time warping, residual network. And um, like then, um, then for like two, 2D signals that we, we have used time frequency analysis to prepare some uh, like spectrograms or scalograms different uh, forms of uh, like 2D signals. Then we have used transfer learning or two-dimensional convolutional neural network, uh, capsule network as many, many different things we have tested. And uh, then the, like the, very recently, we started some up on supervised approaches like um, uh, re uh, restricted Boltzmann machines and uh, so on. So out of all these uh, methods and approaches that I um, told you, I focus on one, which is uh, like, as I said, this is the most recent work of ours that has been published. It was actually the very early work of ours, like two, three years ago, we started this, but it was accepted very recently. It's a funny thing here. And uh, the, the work was focused on uh, the fall detection using ultra wideband radar, using time frequency um, analysis, and also deep learning. So, one um, important part about how we are, we are using the, uh, the radar signals and dif for different activities is that, and how, how feasible was this uh, like approach. And um, we know that, like, um, different human uh, activities, they have different uh, effects and they, on the radar signals and they modulate um, the radar signals in the environment. So different activities will have different impacts on the signal. And, but these, in, uh, different, uh, these impacts are a little bit different. So there is a subtle difference between the received signals of different activities. So then, this is uh, this re like realizes this recognition of different activities and it gives us this opportunity to to uh, to build a model to be able to recognize these uh, subtle differences between the between different activities and between these uh, different modulated signals so this is the whole uh, idea behind uh, using like uh, radar ultra wideband radar signals and uh, time frequency analysis and deep learning so this is the block uh, diagram of uh, the, the proposed approach. And you see different steps. I'll uh, go through them uh, one by one. So the first thing is like uh, the data that we collected. Here is an example of the radar time series for uh, uh, 30 minutes data, uh, including different activities performed by one of our uh, subjects, uh, volunteers. You see different activities are there, including false. So um, the time series uh, that we processed uh, out of uh, radar scattering matrix, the nature of that signal is uh, like uh, the um, uh, non-stationary and means uh, the, uh, the frequent, uh, the, it, has, it includes time uh, varying frequency components. So this is the definition. So that's why we, we, we use like time frequency analysis, like spectrograms and scalograms. So this is the reason behind it. Here you see one example of a falling down time series versus its time frequency a spectrogram, which shows very clearly the, the energy of uh, different, uh, the energy of that activity in the form of like for different colors. So this is the, uh, the signals. Then what we did, uh, we wanted to simplify uh, those time frequency um, signatures, time frequency images. So we converted these uh, spectrograms into binary images to remove uh, any possible noise there, any disconnected regions and come up with the clean image to, to be used as input to our, to our model. So for this uh, purpose, as I uh, mentioned, we have used different approaches, like we, we have used thresholding, we have used also um, uh, the morphological operations and apply some median filtering. And then we came up with the clean uh, binary images. So um, one very important uh, 
challenge or issue that we, we, we were facing was that during even during like different um, activities or daily activity monitoring, you're dealing with um, a, a lot of non-fall non-fall samples versus very few fall samples. So this is a problem of uh, classification and of imbalanced data set. So here for to to address this issue, we have used some uh, kind of data augmentation. So there are different data augmentations. Uh, one is like oversampling using the well-known smooth uh, uh, approach. But what we did was uh, kind of data warping. We've used uh, image transformations. And uh, the reason behind uh, this um, um, image transformations were because we, we, we wanted to, to uh, realize the feature variability between the data samples. And we wanted to have those samples to be um, physically meaningful and gives us the, the real interpretation of an activity. So the kind of uh, image transformation that we have used with like um, uh, uh, rotations, weight shifting, um, height shifting, uh, flipping and zooming and, and, so, uh, and so on. So we wanted uh, to produce uh, exemplars which are actually representative of one activity. Like, if I can give you an example about uh, this data augmentation is that let's say we, we apply um, augmentation using horizontal flipping or using uh, weight shifting. So this is a representative of fall or non-fall activities at different distances to the radar sensor. So this, then it, this is like physically meaningful uh, sample that we added to, the, to, the, to, our, to our data. And also, um, other things like related to zooming or um, height shifting, it's uh, like um, producing new exemplars uh, for for falling down or different activities at different angles to the radar. It means the subject is standing or is, is like falling down at different angles to the radar. So these are all the uh, challenges that we have faced and we, the, the the way that we have addressed them was using the um, data augmentation. So then it, uh, it comes to uh, how we uh, uh, extracted our features and we uh, developed our model. So about the feature extraction like uh, the, and the learning strategy, the common uh, approaches uh, were to extract a set of features in different domains, like in time domain, in frequency domain, or even in time frequency domain, and then train a classifier. In, in these cases, uh, the performance of any model that you want to build depends on the type and also the number of uh, these features. So, and uh, also you need to have the expertise in that domain to be able to extract like relevant features and to, to do some kind of uh, engineering the features. One um, uh, possible solution, if you want to uh, uh, make it automatic, make the feature extraction automatic, was to use of uh, deep learning. And we wanted to, to capture and learn different uh, sh uh, shapes of uh, the, the distributed energy, actually. That, that shape of activity shows the distributed energy of uh, the human activities in time frequency domain. So we have used um, deep learning to, uh, to make it automatic, like the feature extraction uh, is automatic. There is no need for uh, domain understanding about these features. And uh, also um, one other point about this is that we, you can use deep learning completely from scratch and you give the, the, the raw data to it, or you can do some pre-processing and use it in tandem with like different uh, uh, feature extraction methods. So it can be used uh, in both ways. So in this uh, project, in this work, I used the customized uh, CNN for our uh, feature extraction, feature learning, and also for uh, classification. So um, going into the details of uh, like the network and now mostly into the, our most recent uh, uh, paper, here you see like different uh, information about the network, like different kernel sizes, uh, output shapes uh, for each layer, and uh, also uh, the loss and accuracy curves. Like uh, this is the cross uh, entropy loss and uh, for training and test set. 
Um, you see here from these two figures for, for, for the loss, you see the, this is gradually decreasing and it shows that uh, your network is successfully trained after, for sure, after a, a specific number and a fixed number of uh, epochs. And also for the accuracy is uh, pretty much uh, similar and it gets to a, a steady state uh, uh, finally. So um, about our like results and the comparison, uh, we have uh, made some comparison with other state of the art methods and uh, including the traditional ones uh, using uh, K nearest neighbors, losing uh, SVMs and uh, also uh, yeah, different approaches and also the deep learning ones like losing a stack author encoder. Yeah, different analysis and comparison we made like in one, uh, leave one subject out cross-validation, five-fold cross-validation and two-fold, I'll explain it later about the two-fold, which is for the generalizability of the method. And we, all, uh, we obtain different metrics like precision, we call sensitivity, uh, area under the curve and F1 score. So here you see the, uh, the comparison and see that's this uh, automatic feature learning and like all the, of course, all the other pre-processing steps, they have their own uh, contributions and uh, has resulted into like higher precision, higher sensitivity. And now we have a more robust approach for the fault detection. Uh, one very important part in uh, like the, the use of uh, deep learning is to understand how it works, like the interpretability that you hear uh, everywhere now. That's why I put this uh, slide here because uh, the visualization of uh, the activations of the network is very useful uh, to, for everyone to understand how these, these different layers that we put together how they work and how they transfer the input to the final like feature maps and and yeah and to reduce like the sizes to the to the output layer so here you see different feature maps like the first uh, convolutional layer and also uh, for uh, the uh, fully connected layers flattened layer and for the output layer so the convolutional uh, layers they they keep uh, the shape of the image but when we go to the fully connected layers, when we go deeper into the layers, uh, the, um, the activations are, uh, are becoming more abstract and you cannot interpret them like, like visually. You cannot look at them and say, yeah, this is this activity or the other one is the other activity. So in this case, network um, begins to encode the higher level concepts. It means the, in, in higher layers, these activations, they, they are not uh, mostly related to the shape and the image itself, but related to the class of the image. It means the visual content, they are not that much uh, informative, but they are giving you information about the class. And you see that this transition from the flattened layer, it goes to the output layer and the output layer is very representative of the class of uh, that uh, input, that image. Yeah, this uh, two more uh, comparison that I put it here because of the importance. One was the question of, okay, why we, we, um, we are using deep learning. So I, I, I showed you like the improvements in different uh, metrics in different classification metrics. But if we compare our approach, this new approach with the uh, like the previously uh, previous methods using the traditional feature extraction methods. Like let's say in uh, like the two uh, references that you see here, what they did was to use some uh, uh, features and they extracted features in different domains, like uh, the extreme frequency magnitude, like uh, the time span of uh, the events and um, some other features. So they put together all these features and then they train a SVM classif uh, classifier and the results is uh, given there. Also, the one which is very um, interesting here is that that 27F means 27 features that we did actually ourselves. We, 
we gathered like uh, 27 different features like maximum minimum um, mean standard deviations uh, courtesies uh, quant quartiles and uh, uh, some other features to, uh, for the uh, radar time series for its uh, derivative and also for uh, the frequency uh, in the frequency domain as well so then we put together all these features and then we trained uh, an SVM classifier. And so this is the um, comparison between the proposed uh, method in a five-fold cross-validation and those rest of the traditional uh, methods using the uh, manual feature extraction. And you see there is a big difference between different metrics like the accuracy, like precision and so on. And um, this is the, the final result, which is very important. This testing, that's the twofold cost validation that I mentioned. This twofold is related to the generalization of uh, this method. Means we wanted to train the network on, the, the, on a data set collected from a set of subjects in one room and to test it uh, on uh, the data sets that we collected from different set of su uh, subjects in, in another room. So that's why we want to see how this model, how this approach works when it sees unseen data, completely unseen data. So this, um, so that's like mm, the results are very promising and uh, that's why we can say that this is a very robust approach and we can generalize this approach to other environments, to other data sets. As you can see, the, the numbers, like again, the metrics here versus the rest of the other uh, methods. So it's, um, I, I talked about the challenges, mostly about the data augmentation part, but there were other challenges and there are still some challenges um, in this um, work for default detection. So one was very important related to how we dealt with uh, the false negatives and why we had false negatives. So many of these activities like the shape and um, the, the, the distributed energy of that activity, they are very similar. So the similarity, I'll give you an example, like um, if a subject is um, uh, standing at different angles to the radar and, it, uh, and uh, he or she falls down, then the pattern that you see there are very similar to, to the other activities, like to, to standing up uh, quickly or like to, to, to bending over. So these are, these are the challenges. So to recognize and to distinguish between the, the, these um, the patterns and these um, signals, so it's very challenging. It still is, a, it still is like an, an ongoing problem and challenge. So there are many approaches that uh, you can find and uh, other research groups, they have uh, started working on it. So one is um, the, the use of the range information, means other than the time frequency um, coordinate, you bring another coordinate to the place and that's the, the, the range, means the range, the different distances, uh, as I explained about the different range beams that we have in the uh, radar, um, the scattering metrics, we can use all those information about the range and come up with the solution about the, like different uh, patterns for different activities to be more distinguishable. Also, uh, the other solution is to use of like multi-static sensing, means to use of uh, multiple sensors. Where you can monitor um, uh, human daily activities with, mu with multiple sensors like uh, sensors with uh, horizontal and vertical uh, uh, antenna arrays. So this is very helpful and uh, especially in assisted living, which results in better localization, more accurate detection for sure. So these uh, are some of the challenges that uh, we, we went through together. And um, it's good to also talk about the uh, future directions in this field and what are the what are the research uh, topics that if you're interested you want to continue so um, almost all the existing works including ours the they have collected their data their own data in an controlled in a, in a uh, controlled environment 
So, but in reality, what we want is to, to, to have a system to be able to detect falls, to detect different activities in an uncontrolled environment. So this is still an ongoing uh, research. Also detection and tracking of multiple people. So we have focused only on one subject in a room. But what, what if we have other subjects, if more than one subject, and also we had pets in, uh, in that room. So these are all uh, very challenging problems. And also about the unsupervised approaches, I uh, said that we, are, we, are, we have started uh, working recently on unsupervised methods to infer actions and different uh, conditions. New sensors, I talked about the new sensors, what, what we can do, and also we can use the uh, sensor fusion, like different sensors together, like radar plus um, cameras for, like, for building a uh, better system. And uh, in uh, sensor fusion is another interesting and promising research uh, area. So uh, yeah, this is it about the uh, research. So at uh, the end, uh, I, I want to um, like emphasize again on the, the importance of uh, the intelligent healthcare automation as we, as we saw together, how important is that? And especially for the elderly monitoring and for fall detection. So this, uh, this uh, research topic, like elderly fall detection, is uh, becoming like very interesting and many people are attracted to this field, especially because we saw the statistics, the population is aging and we need more uh, automatic approaches, automatic systems. But the use of remote sensing, especially radar in remote sensing in human activity recognition is still uh, in its uh, very early stages and uh, there is a long way and a great potential of working in this field to build uh, a reliable and uh, of course a practical sensing system in the future. So um, yeah, that was it. Thank you very much. If you have uh, any questions, I will be happy to, to answer. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sadri Zami, for the wonderful presentation. Uh, while, okay, there are questions which have already started coming in. Uh, is the data set available to the public or is it confidential? <laughs> no, it's not confidential, it's, it's available, yeah. Uh, in terms of multi-antenna hardware setup, is there any minimum number of UWB radars required within a specific location to accurate fault detection? Yeah, very good question. Uh, yeah, that's, that's up to you how many <laughs> sensors you wanna use, but uh, that's, uh, that's I, I, I told you that this is an ongoing uh, research area. We haven't done it. We haven't focused on this. We, we, we use like by static radar, one, one sensor. But for sure, it's very useful, very helpful, and uh, you need to come up with the, the right angles and uh, like the, op op uh, the optimal number of uh, sensors if you want to build this uh, like multi-static sensing uh, system. Why with no augmentation result is better than with augmentation data? <laughs> very good, <laughs> very keen eyes. Who, who asked? <laughs> it's Ibrahim Ali. That's uh, one of my students. Yeah, 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 yeah. Ibrahim, you had like very, you have very keen eyes to notice that <laughs> in this slide. But uh, yeah, you know why? It, it was not uh, all the case always. The reason is that that uh, we had like very similar when when you augment your data, if you don't have that, the enough variability of the features and the exemplars, you come up with the repetition of your exemplars and different samples. And that's why you don't want it. You don't want the, the redundant information there. You want to have that variability and create like different, uh, different samples in your data set. So that's, that was really good question. So this is the reason in some cases, when you increase your data set, your result gets worse. So, but it's, it should not be the case. You have to have the high variability in different exemplars that you create. 
Uh, Harry has a question. He says, thanks for the great presentation, Dr. Sidri Zami. When applying features extracted from CNN and using them with SVMs, where are you essentially replacing fully connected layer with an SVM? Yeah. Yeah, possible. But, but if you completely remove uh, fully connected layers, that's um, like... Uh, the purpose of fully connected layers are twofold. One is to reduce the dimension of your features and then to, to come up with the, the optimal features at the end, like small and optimal. So if you remove it completely and just add it to an SVM on top of your uh, convolutional layers, it is possible, but you, you need to do it and compare the result and see what, what will happen. But if you're asking me about like, Better approaches, like most recent approaches, actually we, 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 we did it, but I didn't present it here. It's in another work, another paper. There are some other approaches to, to, um, to replace uh, fully connected layers. Like um, I forgot that GMP is a global, something I, I forgot that but uh, you, I, I know that I showed you one of the papers that we had in uh, TCAS2 you can go and check that paper I forgot the name of uh, the approach that we did it was like more than two years ago but that's that's the that's the optimal way if you want to replace your fully connected layers with another approach uh, oh that's the uh, global max pooling yeah Instead of having it, you put a global max pooling on top of your uh, convolutional layers. Uh, so before I ask the other questions, so uh, Hamid Reza, did we remove the fully connected layer and replace with an SVM in our work? No. No. So the question from Harry was related to, he says, where you're essentially replacing the fully connected layer with an SVM. We didn't do that part, right? Yeah, that's, that's what I'm saying. We didn't do that, but... It's if you want to test it, if the question is that how would be the result? Yes, you need to test it and see how different will be the, your result. But this is possible. Mm -hmm. uh, then there's another question. Very interesting talk on deep learning and fault detection. Thank you very much. Can you speculate? Wow. Okay. On how you would think fault detection would evolve for multiple bodies in a room? Hopefully he's meaning that probably with different sets of radars, I believe. So with the single radar, it's not possible currently. Yeah. So maybe I think that's what he's asking. Okay, that's yours, Hamid Reza, to answer. Yeah, yeah, that's, 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 that the answer is correct. For sure, with one uh, single uh, sensor, it's not possible. You have to use multi-sensors and then you come up with the, yeah, the, the, the challenges and difficulties, the, of course it has, uh, but multi, person detection and uh, identifications needs multi-sensors and multi-static sensors. And so that's, that's, a, that's a sure thing. And this is an ongoing research. You see that the most recent uh, papers, publications in these fields are coming with detecting more number of uh, subjects and different activities of these subjects with multiple sensors. Yeah, this is, uh, it was not our, the focus of our work, but this is an ongoing research. So there is another question. Thank you, Professor, for an interesting presentation. So it is not possible, it's not possible to prevent falls, but to reduce the time after fall, right? By any chance, is it possible to prevent falls? Oh, very, very good questions, but prevention, fall prevention, is a very interesting topic. I really like it myself because this has to be the ultimate goal. Yes, it's kind of possible, but you need to, to have a like history of data, history of monitoring a person, different activities, different behaviors. If you, let's say, if you set up a radar in a room, radar uh, acts as a, as, a, as a companion with the person, with the patient, and you, you, you live with that and it's uh, and if you have a like a system a model uh, uh, like embedded there you can 
you can uh, learn all the different behaviors and activities of that person. So any sort of anomaly and ab abnormal behavior of uh, the person, you can detect that very uh, like in very early, you can detect all those abnormalities. So this is sort of uh, uh, fall prevention it means you understand that there, there is something different in that people in, in that person's uh, behavior. So this is something that is doable, I think. But in, uh, yeah, but I, I, I agree that most of the existing words, they just uh, focus on the detection of faults. Means if a person falls, you can detect it right away. You can uh, trigger an alarm and uh, you can contact the caregivers and yes, you can help that person, that patient who has fallen, not to be there for a long time for, uh, and probably not to uh, die. And yeah, these are the things that are uh, doing right now. They are like all the researches are focused on this. But about that prevention, I said it needs a history of monitoring for different activities. Yeah, one interesting work that's going on is also on gait analysis to connect the gait analysis with the fall. And uh, also as Dr. Sadrezami has been pointing out, it is a bit difficult because you need to know the habit of the person. Say in case you put this in an old age home, you need to know about, as he was saying, about the uh, past history, whether these people are taking medications at certain time, if those medications are leading to certain falls. So if those information are all incorporated, then yes, uh, we will be able to produce an alarm, for instance, if we see some abnormality in the way the person uh, is behaving. So that's I, as he said, that is that needs to be done. So that is be, that's beyond the scope of this work at least. Yeah, yeah, that was a really good statement. It was not a question, I think, but yeah, whatever was that, it was correct. Yeah, many things are involved. As you said, yeah. like the medication has like a very uh, great impact. And uh, yeah, that's, yeah, the, the, the solution is to continuous monitoring. You need to continuously monitor someone to be able to learn all different activities and behavior of that uh, person. Uh, there's another question here. Have you tried using the original spectrogram as an image instead of the binary representation image to train your deep learning models? I would think that binary image would lose the information from the signal intensities at different frequencies. Yes, we did. I, I showed that uh, we applied like different, we developed different algorithms, like the work that we have in um, uh, using the capsule network is based on uh, the direct usage of uh, uh, spectrograms. But the reason that we started, uh, first we started to binarize these images, as I said, the, the time frequency images are very noisy, many disconnected regions. Those frequencies that you're talking about, yes, they are frequencies, but they are not the actual, they are not giving you the information about the actual uh, shape of that uh, activity you're looking for. You're mostly, you, you, you can see them as noise. So that's why like the binarization was a good approach to that. But yes, we, we did that and we have some other works focusing on only the time frequency and the actual spectrographs. Uh, actually, Hamid Reza, you may also want to talk about the work that you did with uh, uh, using compressive sensing after, the, uh, after this binarization of the image. Oh yeah, yeah, I forgot completely to add it to that slide. Yes, uh, uh, thanks to Dipayan, I think, who, who did this part. Uh, yeah, we have done some comprehensive sensing on top of the binary images and we have uh, the, app, uh, the, the, the goal was to remove all those redundant uh, information and just focus on that shape that we were looking for. And uh, yeah, and the results uh, uh, was promising. Uh, that is, uh, okay, so now, now I lost track of where the questions were. <laughs> so many questions here. Uh, okay, so this was, uh, that was Yasmina. Okay, and then from Farnoosh, uh, there is a question. Thank you very much for the talk. I wonder if you could let us know if you tried any pre-trained model or just customized 
or just your customized CNN. By pre-trained model, I mean models like Google Net, Inception, etc. Okay, so you have the answer for that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good question. Uh, and uh, yeah, I ex I uh, explained that we have used transfer learning in one of our works. Yes, we have used the VGG, but we can change it to other uh, available networks. And um, um, yeah, that's uh, that's that's doable. You can always now that if you're asking me right now, you start with transfer learning, and then you can. See if it works. That's fine. You can uh, like fine tune it. If not, you can build your network from scratch, like customize uh, CNN or whatever any other networks for your work. But yeah, start with uh, uh, transfer learning and fine tune it. Okay, back again to I think there is another question from Ibrahim. He's asking about. Uh, okay, oh, hang on one second. So th this question is related to, um, again, the CNN. So the input to CNN is bi binary image or segmented image. That's the first part. And then he says, because I think segmented image will carry more information than binary image. Also, the result shown in slide 26 is better than the result shown in previous slide. Why? So there are three questions here. The first question is, is binary image is the input to the CNN a binary image or a segmented image? Then the second, then there is an observation that says that I think segmented image will carry more information than the binary image. Then the second part is the result shown in slide 26 is better than the result shown in previous slide. And the question is why? Let me see the, the result. <laughs> so here. I oh yeah, you know what? Because they are not, uh, they are different uh, forms of uh, analysis. One is one uh, leave one subject out, and the other one was five false cross validations. So this is the if you're asking about the difference. So that's the, that's the reason. About the first part of the question um, about the segmented image and the binary image, we yeah. have used binary images. But segmented of, of what? Of the time frequencies? Uh, I guess probably about the ST, the STFT ones taken as an image, I think. That's what the question reads like, probably. OK. Yeah, so if yeah, I explained that we have uh, used the STFT itself if uh, I'm not mistaken and I get it. I yeah, get the I think question. probably he's asking, do you take the STFT, maximize the, whatever the highest energy to be say 255 or so, and then, and then uh, do a nonlinear mapping on the uh, power spectrum itself to map it to zero to 255. Oh yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, uh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's doable for sure. And uh, in one of the uh, papers by uh, Manus Amin's group, they did this, this thing. This is a, I, I saw it before. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, this is doable. But so, I cannot tell you that which is which, which is better or not. Yeah, you have to, you have to test it. But I saw this uh, changing uh, that you said in, the, in another work. Uh, that's another question. Uh, thank you. Hope uh, hope something comes up related to fall prevention soon. Currently, is it focused to install this just in nursing homes, or is it affordable to install this in individual homes? Maybe you can answer. <laughs> uh, all right. Okay. So the idea was to install this in uh, old age homes, and uh, the uh, the whole thing was to monitor them and then eventually go back to the prevention of falls. But then there are a couple of issues that one, I think we, we, we have not addressed and I do not know how we'll address at this point in time. Most of the falls happen in the bathrooms generally when people are uh, either getting into the tub or out of the tub. And so having the radar 
uh, we we do have experience. We we do have work, we have work done on through the wall imaging as well early on uh, before uh, uh, Hamid Reza joined our group. So we have expertise in that as well. But the issue is that when people are when people have fallen inside the tub. Uh, for instance, it is very difficult to use this RF waves to penetrate that water and then for us to get a reflection back. And so we may have to resort to another mode of uh, observation, I think. So this we haven't worked on. So essentially, can we do this? Yes. Uh, can other modalities help in uh, ensuring that uh, we are able to um, detect or to prevent fall? The answer is yes. If we, if we, I think that there, there is a possibility of doing that. And why, why should I say possibility? Yes, we can do that. But currently, uh, we have not tried. And so I do not want to say that, yes, we'll be able to do that. Thanks. So do you agree, Hamid Reza? Yeah. OK, so then, uh, all right. So there is yet another question from uh, Yasmina again. Uh, so she's now continuing an Ibrahim's question. Leave out one cross validation and K cross validation should theoretically provide similar results. It might be good to include error performance uh, uh, such as standard deviation on your results to explain the variability here. Yeah, yeah, good point. We had we had it actually. I didn't put it here. We had uh, box plots of showing uh, standard deviations. You can see in the the paper, but it's not here. But one leave one subject out. You know, don't forget this word. This is not only leave one sample out. Uh, cross validation. This is leave one subject out. It means we we left the data of one subject for the testing. So this is different from the the actual use of uh, like different samples by samples. So that's why the results are different. They're not uh, similar. But yes, we did that analysis, like the standard deviations. And uh, you can see it in the, in the paper with, uh, with different box plots. Yeah, so one, one interesting thing that uh, I think this problem is much more complicated from the general ones is that the a radar cross-section of people are generally different because we are, we, uh, each one of us have got different uh, composition and therefore the radar cross section is generally different. And also the way if somebody is far away from the radar, then the, those signals are also weak. So we have here a compounding problem that we have to handle as well as people start moving. So I leave it like that. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good point. Actually, at one point I was thinking about like, uh, because now I'm working on personalization. I, I'm really interested to do everything personalized. This is a this is not this is not a bad idea to to look at it as a personalized thing. Means yes, different. Uh, let's say the gait of different peoples are different, and that's why we need uh, this continuous monitoring. Means if you continue continuously monitor one patient, one person living in a building, living in a room, then you're able to, uh, to get decisions and to, to classify different activities much better than like one person versus like the activities of one person versus the other person. This is, this is a good idea. And I believe in this sort of personalization myself, but I don't know if anyone has done it before or not, but this is a good idea. Interestingly, there were a few questions early on with respect to uh, localization of people, many people. So with we, we only had one radar and with one radar, uh, if everybody is stationary, I don't think we can. So if people start moving, then probably we can. But the issue is that even that is difficult because if you have two people coming from different positions and if they cross each other there is no way for us to say who is whom after that because we lose the identity so the we'll have, we need to associate the data with the person and there is no uniqueness once people cross so that's another issue that we have so as uh, dr sadri sami was pointing out we may have to use different modalities or different other aspects as well to be tracked so that we can uh, go back and then say who is who 
and this will be predominantly a problem in a old age home if you have two people living in the house if you have one people then there is no problem of course if you have a pet there is additional problem as well so if you don't have a pet probably we'll be able to do that uh, and of course you hope that people don't go and fall in the bathtub filled with water so if we we may not be able to identify all those things but otherwise i think in general we should be able to provided we have uh, um, studied the environment and all the clutters and other things uh, which dr sadrizami was talking about are all taken care of so there is some pre learning that needs to happen as well uh, in terms of pre processing and as sadrizami has been pointing out repeatedly in this in this uh, presentation that no one has ventured into going out in an environment where people are moving around uh, on their own so everything is staged as shakespeare would say world is a stage so this is what we are doing so we uh, we make sure that all this environment are controlled and we are able to show the results so what would happen if things are uncontrolled uh, to be seen yeah no one knows <laughs> no one knows yes <laughs> Okay. Any other question for uh, Dr. Sadre Zami? By the way, uh, even though he has moved on from our group, he we are still working together, and there are several things that are in line that already in the pipeline, as uh, Dr. Sadre Zami has been talking about, and we are now moved into uh, unsupervised learning. of course in the controlled environment which i believe nobody has shown till now isn't it no no and then we are seeing seeing pro promise of course along with the problems too yeah yeah, yeah. i hope we can uh, like uh, finalize those things in the pipeline and this is going to be very interesting like applying on supervised learning because the ultimate goal is to to perform like everything on supervised you know no one has like uh, the labeled data and the actual data is not labeled so that's why any unsupervised learning uh, if you can like you see like not considerable difference between the results is is going to be much preferable that's correct yeah yep okay so is there any other question for professor uh, dr sadrizami if there are no questions oh i i also forgot to tell you a couple of things uh, Sad, uh, dr sadre zami did mention that this is a this is an invited talk from the ieee ottawa sections um, engineering and medicine biology society as well as uh, the I, ieee ottawa sections uh, A, aerospace and electronic systems and ieee montreal section and also the industrial relations relationship group uh, which is from um, ieee montreal section as well so it's a combined invited presentation of uh, dr sadre zami uh, because there were several interesting parties here both from the radar perspective and also from the medicine perspective biomedical perspective and combining these two from the industry perspective and so we had uh, uh all these people uh, all these groups and sections sponsoring this talk and thanks to all the sponsors and to people who do not know about ieee i would encourage you to go to ieee.org and ensure that you become at least student members try it out and then later become ieee members and if you want to talk please talk to people like uh, mohammad abdul aziz who have been involved as a student for a long time in ieee as well and with this if there are no questions let us give a great uh, uh, applause to uh, dr sadre sami for such an interesting talk and patiently answering all our questions thank you thank you thank so you much thank you very much yeah wonderful thank you thank you so much thank you okay and with this i am going to stop the recording and uh, you guys can still continue and ask questions if you want to and if uh, dr sadre sami has got time <laughs>